Right, I propose we start. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first day of the Water Institute Research Conference, where we are exploring the theme of whether we can achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, in particular, Sustainable Development Goal number six, related to clean water and sanitation in a post-COVID world. My name is Roy Brouwer. I'm the Executive Director of the Water Institute, and I'm joining you here today from my home, like many of you, I, I, I guess. I want to start by acknowledging that we are participating today from traditional territories of the first people across the country. Here in the Waterloo region, I acknowledge that I'm on the Haldimand Tract, land that was promised to the Hede Noshoni of the Six Nations of the Grand River. The Haldimand Tract is within the traditional territory of the Neutro Anishi Nabik and No De No Shone peoples. I would encourage you to take a moment to recognize the traditional land where you are. Today's format will include short talks from each of our three panelists, followed by a moderated panel discussion. Before I introduce the moderator of the day, just a few housekeeping items. Please add your questions to the Q&A box. So not the chat box, but the Q&A box. And you can do this at any time throughout the talk and we will get to those at the end. Use the chat box for general comments or technical issues. And this webinar will be recorded and posted to the Water Institute's YouTube channel afterwards. At this point, I will introduce your moderator for the day, Dr. Nandita Basu. Dr. Basu is an associate professor, cross-appointed between civil and environmental engineering and earth and environmental sciences. She's the principal investigator of the Global Water Futures Project, Lake Futures, and she's the director of one of the University of Waterloo's most interdisciplinary education programs, the Collaborative Water Program. Nanita has an amazing academic track record studying land water interactions and water quality, and we're very proud to have her in the Water Institute. In 2019, she was honored as a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists. Nanita, I'm happy to hand over to you. Thank you, Roy. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from everybody across the world. I would like to introduce today uh, Professor Anna Delatich. Uh, we're very glad Professor uh, Anna Delatich could speak to us uh, today from the Water Institute. She's a Pro Vice Chancellor of Research at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Before this, Anna was the Associate Dean of Research in the Engineering Faculty and the Founding Director of Monash Infrastructure Research Institute at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Anna currently leads a large research group that is working on multidisciplinary urban water issues, focusing on stormwater management and socio-technical modeling. Anna is a Fellow of Engineers Australia and the Australian Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering and Editor of Water Research. In 2012, the Victorian State Government awarded Anna the Victoria Prize for Science and Innovation for her lifelong achievements in stormwater research. Thank you, Anna, for joining us. Thank you. Um, I'm just checking whether you can hear me and see me as well as uh, see my slides. Uh, I just shared my slides. Is everything working? Everything is great. Excellent. So I'll try to talk about um, uh, modeling uh, for sustainable stormwater management um, planning. Um, uh, this is of course, about uh, SDG 6, because um, Australia is and all other nations that are in dry areas are challenged by water shortages. We also, at the same time, I experience much higher frequency of flooding. Um, we are seeing more and more fresh floods, particularly um, downpours, which are causing uh, havoc in our cities. And pollution has been with us for a long time, as you know, and particularly uh, in urban areas, uh, polluted stormwater is becoming significant source of problems because, as you know, we are treating our wastewater and uh, pollution from stormwater is becoming predominant problem to coastal cities, not just in Australia, but in America as well. And one thing that anyway, I've been working on as, as a possible solution to all these problems and um, is called nature-based systems or um, green-blue systems 
in America they're called low impact developments. So these are um, ponds, wetlands, uh, rain gardens. Um, I'm sure you have them in, in Canada as well. Uh, they are beautiful structures which uh, are woven in our cities and they're very good for envir our environment. Uh, for They're predominantly installed for pollution um, management, but they also uh, are contributing to our economy. They're great for flood protection and today I'll talk particularly about that. Um, in Australia we use um, some of these systems to harvest stone water uh, to, to help alleviate problems with water supply, cooling, uh, because they're green, they contain trees often, and definitely property value increase. There are now studies, economical studies, showing that if your um, uh, property overlooks one of these beautiful structures, you can sell your house for more money, which is great news. But how to plan for these blue-green cities? There are so many difficulties. First of all, um, uncertain futures. So we don't know how many people are going to really live in our cities. We just have predictions. And climate change is a big factor. Um, uh, at the same time, we have so many possible solutions and policy interventions to achieve um, this, this beautiful future. And, and that's another problem because they are distributed uh, systems. They are woven in our uh, urban landscapes. They can, and you can achieve the same target um, using multiple uh, options. Um, that's why we've been proper, uh, uh, saying that the only possible way forward is to use exploratory modeling approach, where you would explore all sorts of scenarios of. Uh, city development, climate change, and, and definitely different options. To do this, how we do this, we actually play. We play in a virtual setting. Um, it's a similar stuff you do when you go and play SimCity, or uh, there are so many games these days that are placed on the same um, concept. Um, we developed a model called Urban Beats. It's just been published in Stoughton. Uh, this is a tool uh, which we believe can help us plan um, and explore all these scenarios. Um, this is an integrated model for supporting the planning and design of urban water infrastructure. At this point, it is focusing on stormwater treatment and harvesting targets, but soon we are adding other targets for sanitation and, and fl flood protection. Um, this is a actually a result of more than <laughs> 10 years of work that we've done at Monash University and now UNSW and now EVAG as well. So we've been working um, for a long time to, to come to this point. So what's this model? This model is basically um, like a gaming tool. Um, you put input data, which are obviously terrain, um, uh, also zoning of your city, um, uh, uh, all sorts of different layers of data go into it. And then you, the model uh, generates spatial representation of your city. First of all, um, it's all about land zones, uh, uh, slopes, uh, altitudes, you know, digital terrain. But then what model does, using planning regulations for that city, it reconstructs the city. So it basically uh, creates abstraction of urban form. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is an example where you have um, a suburb uh, and that suburb is cut into grid. 200 by 200 meters or 500 by 500 meters you can select and every um, uh, 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 square has all the data on topology population but also um, housing information road geometry and so on so this block size um, is something you can um, you, you can select and it depends on the size of your catchment but I'm just going to show you how it's done in Melbourne. So this is parcel and then 
we actually create representation of um, one typical household here using planning regulations uh, of Melbourne. And the model's been actually set up not just for Melbourne, it's been set up for quite a few cities in and in North America. Um, then, at the same time, model generates flow and pollution um, uh, mapping. So here it shows how uh, using terrain navigation, it of course uh, creates flow paths um, and also uh, determines concentration of runoff, um, uh, pollution in runoff, which is based on more or less historic data sets uh, for the, um, uh, the Basically, we, we, um, it's, it's pretty simplified approach, but it generates a concentration of uh, uh, pollution in runoff. Uh, then the model actually places um, green infrastructure, what we called in Australia, wash sense urban design and, and new in America, low impact development. So ranging from rain gardens, rain tanks, um, wetlands, ponds, infiltration systems, and it designs them and fits them into this urban space uh, depending on the targets that you uh, uh, suggest to the model. So you may say to the model, I want to reduce the runoff from this area for 20% or you want to basically uh, reduce uh, pollution level uh, total load of runoff uh, of nitrogen should be reduced, let's say 40% and so on. So depending on these targets, model will start designing and placing um, different options, mixture of options like here, for example, um, infiltration uh, trenches or uh, uh, rain gardens, and it looks where available space is at the household level, at the street level, and for wetlands and ponds at the precinct scale. Um, these are all possibilities, and model will do thousand different combinations of these things. It uses Monte Carlo approach and actually looks um, how these solutions can achieve the target which, which we set to the model. So it's a Monte Carlo approach. To do this, we use design curves for these systems. Um, therefore, the model has to be warmed using rainfall data. We usually use six minute rainfall data for a typical year. We can use even 10 years of data if we wish but it takes longer and these design curves then um, which are basically warmed for the area are then used to uh, install uh, um, uh, low impact development systems. Um, so I'm giving you an example on, uh, which is published in this latest paper which shows um, how model will spit out several options um, and these are options which contain, you, you can see here, wetlands and biofilters and so on and so forth. And out of these big number of solutions that can all achieve um, uh, uh, the goal, um, we actually do have also multi-criteria assessment tools, the SANTO, which I'm not going to talk in de details here, but that's a more socio technical tool which takes into account preferences. Um, we did look into at least Melbourne case study where we found the re relationship between um, uh, preferences and, and attributes of, of the neighborhood. Uh, and based on that, it'll, it'll create suitability map. And then you have technical solutions here and more like preferences um, which of course can be solicited through brochure as well. And then model will spit out the top five or 10 options, depending what you want it to do. And then you can use these top options. You can select top, top options and evaluate um, in more depth, interrogate 
um, what these options mean for this area. So it can spit out immediately stormwater volume reductions anyway. It could have been a target, so you are just verifying that what you've done is, is right. But also, um, uh, stormwater loads reduction, water supply by stormwater harvesting. So basically, one of these can be a target, the others are then calculated. The latest stuff we've done, and I must say this is the most complicated one, was uh, to try to integrate into this model flood protection um, assessment. Um, this is a big problem uh, because at the moment we model flooding using 1D, 2D hydrodynamic models. And I'm sure you are aware of Mike, uh, Two Flow, um, HECRAS. These are all very detailed tools which will um, simulate um, spreading of, of uh, floods in our cities. Unfortunately, they are very, very slow and cannot be used for exploratory modeling or continuous modeling. As I told you, we, we do six minute continuous modeling and these systems are on a smallish side and they will not deal with 100 year floods. They will de deal very well with smaller floods and there is a cumulative effect um, uh, uh, which is important to assess. So unfortunately, none of these tools can do that in, in, in the way we want them to do because you, know, you can't model 80 years of six minute rainfall uh, using some of these things, it would take months. Therefore, we start develop, we, we started working on development of far um, simplified approaches uh, conceptual flooding modeling is being a focus of our work in the last um, uh, five-ish years. Uh, we developed two models, Trafidam and Cafe. Um, I'll just a little bit introduce them. And recently we are working on data-driven approaches to um, push these model models further. So I'll just introduce Trafidam, which is the first conceptual flooding model we de developed. So how this model works, it's actually using um, terrain to, uh, 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 to create, we, we call them impact zones. So it's basically areas um, uh, of, of uh, depression. And then we use uh, SWIM, 1D drainage network model, to model total volume of surcharge um, over one event. Um, and these are the blue, the blue uh, arrows. And depending on this volume, we then spread the volume across the terrain um, through these impact zones. So it's just one simple mass balance equation which we use to spread um, water around. And for uh, this, this models being actually tested against, for example, 2D mic flood and other similar tools. Um, and it, it's not dynamic model, it's a static model in the way that it creates only map of maximum flood and it's showed here uh, rough them results and here are results of um, a 2D mic flood. And here is raster bar, uh, raster uh, 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 comparison showing that it's actually not bad um, at all. Um, what is the difference is that traffic them will do a hundred year storm in 10 minutes while one storm, the same storm will be modeled um, in mic flood over 64 hours. And that's, that's the reason why we, we, we wanted to develop it. Um, however, there are again, we thought that's not good enough, 10 minutes too long. Um, and we are, uh, we developed the next generation of these models, CAFE um, is the name of this model, which uses cellular automata to spread the water around. So we are using few simplified, few rules uh, to, to spread this water on the grid-based system. And these grids is pretty small. It's actually usually meter by meter, it's later data. And here is just comparison between CAFE and uh, TwoFlow. Um, and you can see um, uh, black is where the two model 
agree and false alarm is obviously our model of saying there is a flood and miss is where it's actually missing. So it's not bad at all. Here is the same model um, uh, on a rather big catchment against Kekras. Um, however, there are quite a few problems with our cafe. It's not dynamic, so it can't do over time. It doesn't predict spread of the flood over time. But what's more annoying, put it this way, is that if catchment is very steep or in areas where catchment is steep, it doesn't do a good job because it doesn't model dynamics. And at the moment, we are trying to fix this and introduce dynamics and introduce um, another equation, which is obviously a momentum equation, but we want to use a data-driven approach to, to model velocity of flood, um, again, in, in order to, to speed up the model. Um, and why we've done all this? We've done all this, as I told you, to be able to model um, uh, low impact development solutions, blue green solutions like rain tanks, um, uh, and see what is their impact on, on flooding. So, here is an example uh, where we integrated CAFE with um, our uh, modeling tools um, for Busut. And here you can see how we actually tested scenarios of using rain tanks. Um, uh, in, in a suburb um, where we use different train tanks, uh, uh, leaky tanks where basically they leak all the time, so they're usually empty, tanks which have indoor demand, outdoor demand, or full indoor and outdoor, and we compare this against no rain, rainwater tank. So there is a paper we just published on, on this which shows how it's done, but we modeled um, water balance in these tanks over 85 years using stochastic water demand so we knew for every went the level of water in each tank then for then we actually done um, flood modeling but only for large events which have potential to surcharge so we first use a swim to model surcharge volumes and then you, we knew we use CAFE to spread that across the terrain and calculate damage that's caused by this flood. And of course, we've done it for every single uh, event that was of size to create surcharge. And then we integrated all these um, damages. And in this way, um, we could assess impact of, of rain tanks when they're used for, in different ways on flood damages. Here, before we even started, we calibrated our flood model against um, Mike Flood, basically to show that it's working. And just the final slide, the results. Um, when you look cumulative impact of rain tanks, you actually get pretty good results. Here, this is each point shows damage cost of one event, so damage cost in millions for the whole catchment. Uh, this is business as usual, uh, and this is different types of, of uh, you, you, uh, tanks, indoor, outdoor demand, full demand, leaky tanks, and this is routine term period. As I said, we've done 85 years of real data. But where is really, really big effect is in these smaller floods, less than one in 10 years, and cumulative effect of that is what makes these systems important. So here is the total damage um, uh, over 80 odd years when, when, when there, there are no tanks, and this is damage if we have tanks used for different purposes. So up to 30% reduction in annual damage costs um, if you have these tanks. So now we are trying to integrate CAFE with Urban Beats so that we can do scenarios for future with future climate. We also, and this is kind of, um, uh, I'm just trying to say, we try to validate uh, our model on, on, on past uh, scenarios. This is just a little bit um, that there is this IVA um, journal, so you can go and 
send us nice um, papers in the space of blue-green systems. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Delacic, for a fascinating talk. Um, we will hold on to the questions. We'll come back to them in the panel session. I would like to now thank Professor Delacic and welcome our next speaker for today, uh, Professor Wun Jung Ang. Professor Ang is a professor and president's chair in the School of Civil and Environmental University at uh, Engineering at Nanyang University in Singapore. Professor Ang has spent 40 years researching and applying bioprocesses and is the principal lead of NTU's Environmental Bioinnovations Group. He serves as an advisor to various government agencies, technology companies, and investors. He's a recipient of multiple awards in recognition of his efforts in education, research, and industry application. Welcome, Professor Ang. Thank you, Nandita. And good morning and good evening to uh, various participants from uh, various parts of the world. Of course, it's a good evening from my part of the world. Uh, what I would like to do today is to introduce uh, the audience to the research, the technology development, and the deployment in the context of SDG6, and particularly in Singapore's uh, context. Now, why do I emphasize Singapore? The reason, of course, is we are extremely small. Uh, I suppose we can comfortably fit into one of Canada's city, perhaps Toronto, and that's about it. That is the city-state of uh, Singapore. And because of this, we do face some rather unusual constraints, which uh, folks who are living in large countries may not feel. So if you were to ask me, can we achieve sustainable development goals in a post-COVID-19 world? My answer would be, we have to, because if we don't, then we have serious issues. So in relation to SDG 6, water is a national security issue. We don't have enough of our own water. We actually import water. Climate change is a second national security issue because it relates to food. Not that we grow enough of our own food. We do have to import large amounts of food into the country. So we are very sensitive as to what climate change can do to the sources of the food that we bring into Singapore. In fact, if anything, COVID-19 has accelerated the push towards R&D and deployment in certain domains. And one of these would be urban agriculture. Uh, we have our farms on rooftops. Uh, so you won't see large farms over large tracts of land. So our farms are very compact. They're on the roofs, they're on the walls of our buildings. Ellie, can I have the next slide, please? Right, so my focus originally, uh, when my group and I started to work in this domain, was in the wastewater treatment domain. And of course, when we look at uh, wastewater treatment, then uh, the, the issues of sanitation uh, in regard to public health, protecting water catchments, because uh, we do have a few reservoirs, but not enough. And we do protect our reservoirs very, very carefully and to protect the littoral zones, uh, because these are areas where we grow uh, the, the fish the sea life for our food. So the quality of the seawater is as important to us as the fresh water that, is, that we use for drinking. Now above this, we, we also do use our used water. By the way, we do not refer to uh, wastewater as wastewater. We typically refer to wastewater as used water. So the, treat, the treated used water is the precursor to our water reclamation facilities, and we make new water uh, from this used water. Uh, next slide, please. Right, I, I want to now quickly draw you more specifically into some of the work uh, that we do. Uh, this gives you an example of the R&D work 
Now, a somewhat more unusual uh, characteristic of the group that I am with is that we take our research from laboratory through technology development and then engineering and finally into deployment. So the group actually designs and uh, on occasion even built the facilities that you see. Uh, examples of this that you see on the screen at the moment. So these are full scale examples of the technologies that the group has developed over the last so many decades. The research directions are primarily on kinetics and from kinetics, we go into process control and optimization. The original piece of work that the group worked on was on microbial consortia and morphology control, meaning how we can manipulate the shape of flocks, the density of flocks, uh, whether we have dispersed growth or whether we have uh, filamentous growth and whether we have uh, biofilms. Now, from this, then the various reactor configurations uh, came out. And uh, the primary application originally, and it still remains so, is on effluent treatment, meaning used water treatment, both domestic and industrial. Next slide, please. Now, I've very quickly touched on the fact that we are recovering water and we look at use water treatment as the first step towards water reclamation. So obviously a resource that we recover is water. Now, if you're talking about sludges and strong wastewaters, then an, uh, another resource that we recover would be energy. So typically uh, this could be biogas and uh, we derive the energy from these various types of uh, strong organic streams and the energy is then used to uh, supplement the energy required for effluent treatment or even within the uh, factories themselves. Now, are the useful components that are now coming forward and which we are looking at very closely uh, would be NPK plus carbon to supplement the uh, soils that we use for agriculture. We look at biochar and very interestingly, over the last few years, bioactives for agriculture meaning signaling compounds that we use to manipulate the behavior of the crops that we grow. Next slide, please. Now, uh, again, just some pictures to show you what happens when uh, we moved from the laboratory uh, onward into uh, the field. So again, you see reactor systems. These are engineered systems that came from designs which the group developed. Uh, what you see on the screen at the moment, uh, anaerobic systems, various reactor configurations for anaerobic systems. On the previous slide, uh, they were primarily cyclic systems. Now the group is strongly associated with cyclic processes. Now, uh, the, the systems that you see on the screen uh, represents vertical integration. Now the group is very mindful of how we deploy technologies. So very often we deploy technologies in a vertical manner, meaning that we have pre-treatment and then primary treatment, uh, and, and then we have a secondary treatment and tertiary treatment. So in uh, our minds, this would represent a vertical arrangement of the unit processes that uh, we develop. So anaerobic systems typically sit at the front of a treatment uh, train and they would be performing the roles of the pre-treatment uh, processes. So again, it is for effluent treatment, for sludge treatment, and here the resource that we recover would primarily be biogas and on occasion where there's enough of it, NPK for uh, formulation of fertilizers. Next slide, please. Now, uh, there is, I suppose, a question. If Singapore is that small, uh, why are we interested in all these technologies? Uh, do we even have enough projects to, uh, to deploy such technologies on? And the honest answer is no, not in the country itself. 
But uh, we should not forget that geographically, Singapore is almost sitting right in the center of the ASEAN region, the Southeast Asian region. And for that reason, we do travel out into the region. Uh, we have shared interest in food production and so on. So we do travel out into the region. And because of that, uh, the technologies that we develop are carried out into the region. So what you see on the screen at the moment is a project that has gone into service, by the way, and this is for a bean curd factory where we applied the anaerobic process. Uh, this is a particular process that is associated with the group. Uh, Enfield is a trade name that we use for this particular design. It's based on biofilms and we recover biogas from the uh, bean curd factory uh, wastewater. Next slide, please. And here is an even larger plan where we again apply our technologies. In this case, the uh, rectangular things that you see at the front of the uh, picture, uh, those are uh, cyclic reactors. So you see eight cyclic reactors uh, sitting at the front there. And this particular uh, facility has been constructed and is being operated in East Malaysia. So it is for a piggery a huge pig farm, and uh, there is a slaughterhouse and a meat packing house all within the same location. So water, the wastewater is treated, the treated water is recycled, the sludges is fed into the anaerobic digesters. Those are the green mushroom-like things that you see in the background. And the biogas comes out, is fed into the gensets. The gensets produce electricity, and this then goes towards chilling the meat that is uh, being packed in the meat packing house. Uh, next slide, please. And this is an example of a facility that is just about to enter service in uh, Singapore itself. So this is home. Uh, my group designed this facility. Uh, again, it uses a technology that is identified with the group and this is a pulse bait filter. So it is based on a biofilm that moves within a anaerobic reactor coupled with a aerobic cyclic reactor. The water that is produced then goes into a water reclamation plant and the water is recycled into the factory. Now, I think uh, for those of you who, who are uh, observant, you might have noticed the word beverage on the screen. So this shows you the level of quality of recycled water that we can achieve. Uh, it is going back into a factory that is producing food. So uh, it shows you the, the level of technology that we have to put in place to ensure that we can maintain stable quality of the, of the reclaimed water that we are pulling back into the factory. Next slide, please. Now, I, I want to, before I end, I, I want to now uh, touch on an adjacency. So uh, if you, you know, sort of cast your mind back, I've used uh, a word previously, and that is vertical integration. There's also horizontal integration, but it's not so obvious here in this particular case. But uh, now I'm touching on an adjacency. So we do look at the technologies that we have created previously, and we move it into an adjacent uh, domain. And in this particular instance, we have moved some of our fermentation technologies into urban agriculture, and of course, regular agriculture as practice in the, uh, the region. The aim, and this would be consistent with SDG 6 or SDG in general, the, uh, the, one of the primary aims would be to reduce water consumption, and to reduce pollution that is associated with the use of uh, pesticides and fertilizers in agriculture. Next slide, please. And uh, I think because we are close to the industry, uh, we are not only mission driven, we are also value driven. So at the end of the day, uh, we always would ask, uh, now that we have reached the end of our research, would the technologies that we develop be adopted by the industry 
and bring economic benefit to the stakeholders. So we are always looking for what we call points of concern. And in this particular case, uh, if we are looking at agriculture, uh, there are certain points of concern which interest us. And you can see some of this in the, uh, in the bubbles, all right? And uh, the work that we are doing is intended to address some of the bubbles that you see on the screen. Next slide, please. Right. This slide shows you the current research that we are conducting, and it is on bioactives. Now, the, the work on bioactives draws on the work that we did earlier on, on signaling compounds. Uh, microbes communicate with each other. So if you are into molecular biology and so on, uh, you realize that microbes do communicate with each other. They send signals to each other. And these signals are largely chemical signals. So we have worked out uh, via our research how to get the microbes to release some of these chemical signals and how to harvest these chemical signals and to concentrate these signals. And we then apply it on plants. Uh, the plants then mistake these signals for their own signals and they react uh, in certain ways. All right, so we can use these to control the growth of the plants, flowering, uh, fruiting, uh, and of course, the intention is to improve the yields of the crops uh, that, uh, that we are growing. Next slide, please. And here is one particular compound that we have worked on. Uh, it is an antifungal compound, and this signals to the, uh, the plant, and it will be a palm tree, to uh, resist the attack of a particular kind of fungus. Next slide, please. And this obviously is not applied uh, in Singapore because we don't grow uh, too many palm trees in Singapore other than ornamental palms. So the work has gone out primarily to ASEAN and we are now also looking at uh, South Asia where they have uh, coconut palms. Next slide, please. Some pictures to show you where the problem lies. Uh, I'm quite certain that many of you have heard of the uh, issues, the environmental issues that have been caused by uh, oil palm plantations. Uh, there would have been clearing of forests, burning of forests, and so on. Now, I think a lesser known fact is if you burn, then you sanitize the ground. And the incidence of fungi, now, mind you, this is not based on hard facts yet, so we're still gathering the information. Uh, but anecdotally, we, we now suspect that if you don't burn, then the incidence of fungal occurrence and infection increases. And this is what happens to the oil palm trees uh, if they are infected, they die, all right? So uh, the fungus attacks the vascular system of the palm trees. Next slide, please. And uh, this is the penultimate slide. So this gives you a, the sequence of uh, things that we did to develop that particular antifungal uh, signaling compound. Uh, we tried to be as green as possible. We actually cultivated the microbes on waste material like plant residues and organic manure. We did the, uh, the fermentation uh, experiments in the laboratory, we did the extraction, and we ended up with the phytohormone uh, products. Next slide. And this is what happens when we scale. So if you can recall, right at the beginning, I said we would do the research in the lab, then we would do the technology development, and then the engineering, and finally, we would get to deployment. So what you see on the screen at the moment is an example of deployment. So this is the full scale deployment that we have uh, made to produce the phytohormones that we have targeted. Next slide. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ang, for an exciting presentation. 
I would like to now welcome Dr. Veena Srinivasan from India. Dr. Srinivasan, do we have Veena? Uh, Dr. Srinivasan is a senior fellow and director for the Center for Social and Environmental Innovation at the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment, or what is typically known as ATRI in Bangalore, India. Veena received her PhD from Stanford University's Emmet Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources. Her research interests include impacts of anthropogenic alterations to watersheds, surface groundwater connectivity, urban water and lakes, sociohydrology and sustainable water management policy and practice. She held the Prince Claus Chair at Utrecht University from 2018 to 2020. Welcome, Veena. Thanks, Nandita. I just wanted to check before I start that my screen is visible. Your screen, screen's good. Would screen. you be able to turn your camera on? Um, yes, but it's not allowing me to do that. It, uh, it says the host has stopped it, so. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, got it. All right. Uh, so firstly, thanks very much uh, for this invitation. It's a real pleasure to address this audience today. And after two very uh, exciting talks that I personally found very interesting and will be sure to uh, talk to the speakers later. But this talk is actually very different from the two previous talks because I, I think it's, um, uh, I took the topic uh, of can we recover from COVID-19 very to address SDG 6 very seriously and prepared something which was very raw from rural India. And I hope uh, that I'll be able to draw uh, some of the interest of this audience because uh, of the storytelling style that I've decided to use. So I'm going to start with a story um, of uh, a kid that I met at the park last week. I was walking in the park and a kid came to me and asked me for directions. Kid meaning he was actually 18 uh, and asked me for directions. And uh, we got walking in the same direction and uh, because I was going that way and I asked him about his life and he said he had just moved to the city um, from the village um, of Gulbarga, which is a very dry semi-arid part of the state of Karnataka where we live. Um, and he said that his um, father had been a small holder and had died 10 years ago and um, his uncle the father's brother had taken over the father's land and displaced them from it. And he was now supporting his mother, who was an agricultural laborer, and also putting his kids through school, as well as putting himself through school. And he was also working, he would go to college the last, this was the second year, it was going to be his second year. He was going to, uh, he would go to college from nine to five and then work in one of the city restaurants from five to 11, and then study and then start again the next day. And uh, all, the, all the restaurants have shut down. And so he literally did not have food to eat. He did not have a room over his head and he was just willing to do anything. Now, COVID-19 um, uh, has done terrible things to, uh, to rural India, but particularly migrant labor into cities. And many, any of you that's following the news might have seen these really heart-wrenching sites of 10 to 40 million people who migrated back to villages from cities. A massive, massive reverse migration, which occurred in a very, very short period of time. Now, the question is, what kind of life are they going back to in villages? And I'm not saying that the migration is permanent, but just to say, what do they have waiting for them? One of the biggest problems with Indian, uh, with rural India and livelihoods in rural India is that the average size of farming plots has declined very, very sharply just because of land subdivision and increase in population. And so barely um, the average holding size uh, in India is barely now uh, about two acres. And the land holding distribution of the population um, has moved from uh, towards from uh, the large land holdings decreasing. Um, they were already very small, but now marginal land holdings of um, less than half an acre constitute two thirds of all of India's farmers. That's a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of land. Um, and not only that, uh, almost half of India's farmland is uh, continues to be rain fed agriculture. And from our primary studies uh, in the Karnataka region that entails um, uh, an income of barely $500 per year per acre 
often to be distributed within a, a, between a family of four individuals. And so we're talking about a massive, massive employment crisis where um, if the urban economies have shut down, people moved away from cities to, or from villages into cities because there was nothing waiting for them back in the cities. And the promise of urban jobs, uh, education, all of that was what kept people going. And now overnight, all of those people have moved back, albeit temporarily, but moved back with nothing uh, awaiting them in villages. And so the question then was, this was essentially one aspect of what the Green Revolution in India sought to address when starting uh, in the early 1960s, uh, where um, there was a heavy, heavy investment in irrigation. And indeed, irrigation in India has gone up over time. However, the vast majority of India's irrigation, especially since the 1970s, all of the growth has been from groundwater. Um, and uh, and therefore, uh, uh, in contrast, almost all of the investment or the large scale investment by uh, the irrigation departments and government departments has been in surface water infrastructures, especially large dams. Now, one a shocking statistic uh, from the state of Maharashtra, where one of my PhD students was working, um, showed that despite an investment of um, uh, of several tens of billions of dollars, or actually several hundreds of billions of dollars over a decade um, in that one state, uh, canal irrigation, canal irrigated area did not even increase 0.1%. And so irrigation areas stayed flat, um, construction projects have been through the roof, and all of the actual increase in irrigated area has been through uh, groundwater. And not surprisingly, because farmers at the end of the day are rational creatures, if you're a small rain-fed farmer, your, your income, as I said, would be about $500 a year, while if you were an irrigated farmer, it might be uh, five uh, times that much. And so it's not, it's not irrational for a farmer to want to find irrigation, except what's happened because of that massive push towards groundwater has, is that groundwater is already severely overexploited in many parts of India. And so continuously expanding irrigation in an area which is already water stressed, where you already have um, a small hold of farmers, primarily rain fed, earning next to nothing. Um, uh, they have no other place to go for water. It's, it's, uh, there's plenty of sunshine, not enough land, and the only way they can possibly increase the productivity of that land is through irrigation, except we've al already overexploited irrigation. Uh, the other half of the issue, of course, is the quality, soil sal land degradation and soil salinization, both because of des desertification as well as over irrigation in the few canal command areas. Uh, overall, one would say that the Green Revolution based intensification of high input agriculture is slowly starting to hit some environmental limits. And this is exactly why, if you think about the SDGs and the Sustainable Development Goals, we're exactly propounded for this reason that the initial focus on the Millennium Development Goals or just the development agenda was how do we get farmers out of poverty. And now we've basically gotten many millions of farmers out of poverty, but we are beginning to hit some of those growth limits and because of the environment. And so basically we can't, we can't, we can't develop anymore unless we or change our fundamentally change our development paradigm. Now, in other words, in order to achieve SDG 6, and particularly in the post-COVID world, we essentially need to do what is seemingly the impossible. On one hand, we need to sustain the environment and sustain the natural resource base. We might do this by regenerative agriculture or improved efficiency or managing water as a common pool resource. A, a, a number of variety of, of options exist. We also need to create rural livelihoods at the same time. And that might be whether it's reduction of post-harvest losses or risk reduction, value-added activities, labor-saving technologies, market linkages. There are, there are a suite of options. The problem is doing all of this and actually making it happen on the ground is a non-trivial problem. Now, I'm going to tell you three stories, uh, which I hope will inspire some of the, uh, the students and uh, you know, listening in to think about a very different way of about how science actually intersects what happens on the ground. Um, I've been an academic researcher for much of my life. I continue to have PhD students. However, 
what we find is that a lot of the work that we are doing actually doesn't end up intersecting what's happening on the ground at these very, very, very crucial uh, points that it should. So the first story I'll tell you is of how the government is handling it. And the government's way of doing it is to continue to push, push for agricultural intensification on one hand. Um, so the free electricity policy, fertilizer subsidies, pesticide subsidies, um, all of these are kind of what you would call have led to the ag industrial agriculture, um, uh, industrial ag agriculture enterprise in India. And on the other hand, government of India has also been uh, has also been pushing zero budget natural farming and low input agriculture as a way of I would say at some level almost a means of desperation for um, the for for to see if we can somehow reverse and regenerate these degraded agricultural lands and do something for rain fed farmers. The, um, the, the problem is that a lot of the fundamental research that underpins some of these actually hasn't been done. And so you have this, uh, this on one hand, a push towards increasing large industrial agriculture. On the other hand, increasing amounts of government budget spending spent towards zero budget uh, natural farming. But really, the, some of the fundamental drivers that I believe might explain why zero budget natural farming or regenerative agriculture might work, the, the fundamental science is missing. And so one theory that I've heard uh, some of the farmers on the ground tell me is that some of these regenerative agriculture methods work because they, um, they promote the soil microbiome. And this completely changes the infiltration characteristics, the soil moisture characteristics, and it allows uh, increase in organic uh, carbon, allows you to irrigate less, and therefore have um, uh, require much less um, irrigation, and a pathway can be found out of it. But, but actually, the scientific basis for some of that simply hasn't been done yet. So it's a, it's a big, um, it, it's, it's a big blank. Um, the second story is a story of what a number of impact investors are doing. And impact investors is kind of a, a modern, um, uh, you know, term that came up out of the frustration that we can't only develop the social um, sector through NGOs that have to be permanently grant funded because there just isn't enough grant money to stretch far enough. And so some of that has to be done through social enterprises that will pay back and then that money can then be invested in, um, in another part of the country and that will pay back and so on and so forth. Now, I had a conversation with um, uh, one of these impact investors. I've had several conversations with impact investors in the water sector, in the rural water sector. And one of the investors uh, was you know, talking about a solution that um, improved, and there are several of these companies, so I don't want to pick on one, but was talking about um, um, uh, a company they wanted to invest in that was going to increase recharge of groundwater through some means. Now, the farmers were willing to pay, according to them, were willing to pay because they, they would also have an IoT-based borewell sensor device that would uh, tell the farmers how much water they have in their borewell, and the farmers were willing to pay a subscription price for both the borewell sensor and the app, which would tell them how much water they have in the well. And then they would also, um, uh, the impact investor was asking me, well, is there a way for us to uh, to figure out net metering so that we know how much is being recharged through the bore well and we can kind of charge for that in some way and so on and so forth. And my argument was that investing in a recharge, a, a, a one point recharge device is no different from investing in a bore well ring because it's essentially allowing farmer, you know, it's accelerating the rate, rate of recharge from a shallow zone to a thousand feet or an 800 foot bore well, and only the richest farmers have the 800 feet bore well. So you have a, a case where you're taking water from a shallow zone, accelerating it to the deepest, deepest zone. So the farmers with the deepest bore wells are able to then access it and willing to pay for it. Um, it's, it works fine. It Maybe it even works fine as a business enterprise, but it doesn't works, make any sense from either an equity perspective or from an environmental perspective, because you're taking water which is at 200 feet and pooled at 200 feet, sticking it or taking it all the way to eight, you know, letting it accelerating the recharge to 800 feet and then pumping it back and just increasing the pumping cost. And I was like, why? What's the justification of a social enterprise engaging in this? And yet, it's surprisingly hard to 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 convince um, to convince investors 
that that looking at the overall picture in terms of water as a common pool resource, looking at um, the energy and the, uh, you know, the, ex the environmental externalities uh, is something that they should be doing because that's not the way that impact investors are set up. And so um, there's a serious lack of science going into some of these conversations. The third example is philanthropic foundations. There's a ton of CSR money as well as uh, what I would call rich billionaire Phila uh, you know, philanthropists in India who are putting money into the rural sector. And typically they're doing things like the silting of tanks or they're investing in farm ponds. Again, nothing terribly wrong with either of these exercises. However, there's always a concern that if you invest heavily in farm ponds, who are the farmers that actually have the land to build the farm ponds so that they can grab a little bit of extra water. And if you're desilting the tanks, that's great. If the problem was that the tanks were um, lacking in storage capacity, in most parts of India, because of groundwater over exploitation, the problem that we have is the absence of runoff. Because groundwater has been deployed, uh, has been over exploited so much, surface runoff has completely disappeared. And does it make sense to keep desilting tanks when the problem is the absence of surface runoff generation because of groundwater ex over exploitation? Um, rather than because the tank for some reason was overflowing because it had no place to store the water. And so the problem is that there is a serious absence of science in these conversations. Um, and the bigger problem is that if you actually look at what academic research is happening, particularly in the natural sciences side, and what's happening in terms of the practitioner sector, there's absolutely no overlap. I mean, there are like maybe two people in the entire country that sit on the... Um, uh, in the intersection in that Venn diagram. And so that's a serious problem because on one hand, we can write all these academic papers, uh, but none of that is going to any of these audiences that really matter. And where the audiences that actually matter are going is actually almost certainly um, from an academic perspective going to make things worse. And so we really need to ask the question of how do we change this and fundamentally break this, this gridlock where on one hand, there's, there's actually an underinvestment in research, in my opinion, in, um, in India, in, in, in the rural water sector side, particularly, because there's very little money in it. For water as a common pool resource, there isn't any con construction contracts. There's really nothing for people to make a ton of money on. We're talking about very, very, very poor people who have nothing to give in terms of uh, monetizing anything. And so there tends to be a lack of investment, unlike the urban sector, which also is underinvested, but at least there are there is money because cities are rich, and so there is money going back, whether through the corporate sector or CSR or just through through uh, citizens who made their you know their riches with with the IT sector and so on. Um, so one of the things we did to see well how can we break this gridlock? So we did a bunch of use case interviews late last year, and I'm just putting this uh, up as a use case. So one use case interview we did was with an NGO that was working with the community to say, how do we develop a soil and water conservation plan in a micro watershed where we bring the entire community together and say, how much water do we have and how do we spend it? And a lot of NGOs on the ground do this type of work. And what they one of the gaps that they talked about is, well, you know, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the work is basically creating a collective understanding because water is a common pool resource. But communities lack any framework or ability to understand the collective context. They might know where my well is or that stream is, but not really how my well affects your well and so on. And so there's a lot of participatory resource mapping that needs to be done. Um, and often this takes months and months to actually achieve. Because um, just because, and it shouldn't take months and months to achieve because um, um, because we have technology, we have really cutting edge tools, particularly with Google Earth, Google Earth Engine, um, just a QGIS. I mean, all of these are open source tools. They exist. Uh, ODK exists. So you have ways to kind of uh, mix and match all of these tools, but, but still takes months and months. Everybody is still doing it with paper and pencil. Um, another case was with a large donor um, uh, who wanted to know whether their funding was effective. Now, this particular donor was a what I would call um, an overseas donor. They, they collect money from uh, non-resident Indians living all over the world, wealthy non-resident Indians. And then they, they do their research and then parcel it out to NGOs working on the ground. And one of the things they asked over and over again is um, the same thing. Participatory resource mapping takes 80% of our budget. 
but also uh, they, they said we don't have any ways to track effectiveness of the we can track outputs we can say how many structures were done but we can't say anything about outcomes did it make any difference to anybody in any way and they were looking for data and tools and, uh, and, and metrics to track effectiveness in a way what they called reasons to believe how do we give um, our crowdfunded um, uh, donors reasons to believe that what we are doing is, um, is good. So I would say when we looked at this in whole, we would say that there are three, there are isolated su success stories. It's, it's a country with a many, many, pilot, uh, many, many successful pilots. Very few of them have scaled. The first reason, of course, is because a lot of our intervening continues to be siloed. It continues to look at, 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 at the problem, either just groundwater, just surface water at the plot scale, but not looking at the watershed, um, the plot to watershed um, links. The second problem is a lot of the practitioners have blind spots. There are things they don't know. And because of this, they're intervening in suboptimal ways, but also there's very little learning. Everybody has to reinvent every single, um, uh, every single lesson uh, from scratch. And the last is that there's, there's a lack of credible evidence. Even the best donors in the water sector try after some time. And you've seen the amount of philanthropic work, the money that's gone into some of these villages, and yet the metrics at the state scale are just going in, um, you know, are, are, just, are, are just continuously dropping. And so if that's the case, you're not doing any better, people kind of look at this and say, this is an ocean, I can't deal with it. I will deal with this one tiny piece that I know how to handle. Um, so one of the things that we did is to say, how do we change this fundamental, um, uh, and, and this, I have to say, this is only a problem that we are starting to, to try to deal with. It's not something we've solved, but we say, how do we try to develop better problem typologies? How do we diagnose better? Instead of saying, um, starting with what most um, uh, practitioners on the ground say, this is our menu of things we know how to do. And now we're going to figure out where to put them. So we know how to do check dams. We know how to do tank seed desilting. We know how to do, uh, you know, uh, how to do um, laser leveling. We know how to do soil and water conservation. Now we're just going to use GIS to figure out where to do it. But really think about, start from the fundamentals saying, what's the problem I'm trying to solve? How do I develop a, a diagnosis tool that helps me diagnose? How do we find solutions that will actually be customized on one hand, but on the other hand, also be able to learn from others? And then how do we track effectively where we are going beyond tracking outputs to actually tracking out, outcomes? And so this is this water solution framework um, for rural water security is something that we are beginning to work with. Uh, it's None of this is trivial, uh, so I would welcome any piece that people in this group think that they would be able to help with. We are really looking actively for collaborators. We've got some initial seed funding to start this work. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Veena, for a fascinating talk. Uh, I would like to now uh, welcome all the panelists back into a panel session. We've been collecting your questions. Uh, as we've been moving forward. And I would just uh, like to welcome you all again for your questions and your participation. And what we are going to do in this panel session is uh, myself and Nancy Gosher, we will uh, moderate the panel session. I'll start off starting with some questions uh, from the audience and then hand it over to Nancy to ask a few other questions. So let me start by again thanking all uh, the panelists for fascinating talks from different corners of the world, different approaches uh, this morning. That was uh, really enlightening and really interesting. Um, maybe let's start with a question to Professor Anna Dalitich. Uh, this is a question from Marian Osei, a doctoral student from Ghana. And Marian's question is about the use of the urban beat model in uh, developing countries uh, like in Africa. And her question is related to the fact that your model is developed for more planned urban areas. How do you deal with unplanned areas like urban slums? Um, yeah, thank you very much. I read this question. It had few few points there. Um, unfortunately, we never tested it outside developed countries. So we tested it in quite in Europe, in US, in of course Australia, but we never tested it for unplanned urbanized areas. 
So I'm not sure, you know, we, I think we can make some assumptions, but I'm not sure it would do a good job. Um, about six minute resolution, uh, the question was whether it can work for another. Yes, it can, easy. But the reason why we go for such low resolution on rainfall data is because these systems are small. And if you are to model small storages, well, you do need to have low resolution of rainfall data, otherwise it's actually result, result is wrong. Um, and um, about calibration, uh, yeah, we do calibrate, but in a different way than normal hydrological models. We calibrate actually on, on um, particularly planning, planning tool, urban planning tool. Um, and as I said, I didn't have time. I can show you how we um, uh, validate that it's doing good job. It's on impervious surfaces and, and more or less form, urban form. Um, I think that's all. Um, yeah, it's now being used in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Nancy, do you want to take over? Sure, thanks, Nandita. Um, this question this question's for uh, Professor Ng. Um, so we're wondering, um, sitting here in, uh, in Canada and perhaps other parts of the world, uh, there, you know, we, I'm going to ask Nandita actually to take over. Okay. It seems like I have some background. Noise. Okay. Um, so uh, Professor Ng, are there any public perception issues related to water recovery from wastewater? Often when you're thinking about wastewater, and this is a question from Professor Roy Brower, um, often when you're thinking about wastewater, there's a bit of a yuck factor that plays a role in public perception. Is this also the case in Singapore? Is there, for example, public awareness raising campaign to save water, but perhaps also to educate the people about the safety of these biotechnology processes. And then Professor Brava talks about the example of California lettuce, which was irrigated with wastewater because of water shortage and caused various public health concerns. Right, uh, thank you, thank you for the question. Yes, there, there could have been uh, public resistance initially, but uh, there was a very strong, and I would say a, uh, a continued uh, education uh, process uh, done. Now, um, the population was educated even before the new water was released uh, for public consumption. The target were the children. So we started with the children, the school children, and uh, the, we actually built an exhibition center where the plan was uh, modeled and operated and the, uh, the students would be brought through this exhibition center and it would be explained to them what was happening to the uh, water as it came in from the front and finally as it exited uh, towards the, uh, the consumers. Uh, we also then had a situation where, uh, and in fact, I, I was uh, on the team that developed the new water. So we even had a situation where the, uh, the, the politicians, the minister in charge, drank the water in public. He was filmed drinking the water with the team uh, that developed the, the water. So we all drank the water to show that it was good enough. Now, vocabulary is also very, very important. Uh, you may notice that I sort of alternate between the word wastewater and used water. So. Uh, Locally in Singapore, we have largely eliminated use of the word wastewater. So we use the word used water. And I think for the adults, uh, at least, psychologically, this is very important. So, you know, as an analogy, would you buy a waste car or would you buy a used car? Right? So, so it is something like that. Uh, we also created cartoons, uh, which help to explain uh, the various processes, uh, what happened as the water went through these various processes. For example, we had a cartoon that showed a reverse osmosis membrane that kept the pathogens out because the holes were so small, the pathogens couldn't struggle through uh, the, the holes in the, the membrane. 
So there was this very consistent and contiguous uh, education that continues to this very day. Sounds good. Thank you so much. I like the used water versus used car <laughs> analogy. <laughs> Nancy? Yes, okay, so this next question is for Vina. Um, so what are, the, what are the solutions here? Um, there's, uh, you mentioned you know, the problem of a disconnect between research and practice. Um, are, is there an opportunity for international collaboration that might help bring some expertise? Or you know, how do we, how do we um, help scientists work on some of these fundamental ish science questions around sustainable agriculture? Um, is, is water pricing something that has been brought up as a potential solution? Do you have some ideas on this front? Yeah, um, I think there's lots and lots of potential for international collaboration, uh, particularly on the fundamental sciences side. The only thing and one of the reasons I wanted to give the talk in this way is that I think often a lot of the fundamental science, because we have to write for a particular audience, um, you know, and, and in a particular journal format, uh, not a lot of the work even that ends up being done, let alone uh, the outcomes ends up being communicated. So often we, have, we fall back into silos of doing work in a particular way, rather than saying what, what's the question that needs to be answered and can I answer it? We try to say what can we publish and then work back from there. So I think there's a little bit of the type of work that's being done itself that's a problem. Um, the second thing I would say, and this is what I'm finding in a lot of the work that I'm doing, is that there's about, you know, 500 times more science communication that's needed to be done. Because a lot of the stuff, and, and this is more on our urban side, which I didn't talk about today, but, you know, a lot of the answers exist in papers. Um, translating those answers into anything that people outside of the field understand uh, is... I mean, the amount of investment and effort we need to do has to be an order of magnitude about. That's how bad we are at the moment. So we write stuff in these archaic papers and written in formats that no layperson or no practitioner is ever going to read. And, and so the question, and I don't blame academics for this because you're not incentivized for doing it. But then as a society, we need to think about, well, whose job is it to translate all of that cutting edge knowledge into anything that people can actually absorb. And that might then bridge some of the translation problem from research to practice. Um, your last question is on pricing. I mean, the thing is, I don't like just saying that we should price water because that's the obvious thing, but we're talking about people who are already so poor that, um, that yes, you should price, but if you only price it and don't do anything else, that's not gonna help anyone because it's just going to, those 600 million people the reason water was subsidized in the first place is because India is a democracy. And if you have 600 people who are at the point of starvation and are all going to die, the government is going to say, what's the easiest thing I can do in order to get them to not be that poor? And I don't have money to spend, so I can give them free electricity, right? And so while it's a terrible policy to give free electricity, um, it's also not enough to say overnight just price. And, and I, again, this is, I see this in a lot of academic papers where they'll say, well, you do these exotic things on what's going to happen to consumer and producer surplus if you do this thing and what's the amount of change. But that doesn't help anyone. There is still a political economy. So you need to then say, if we are increasing pricing, how are we going to actually make this um, a, a worthwhile effort for farmers so that we worry about what's going to happen to 600? And if it means that we can't have 600 million people, we shouldn't have 600 million people being small and marginal farmers, that's okay. That might be an answer. But we still need to say, is there enough then for 300 million people who can actually pay the full price of water and then earn a decent living? So I do think that then saying, what kind of, what does that nature of farming look like? How do we create those market linkages to make sure that they actually uh, earn a decent living? So I always like to start with a jobs angle because in my opinion, the water crisis is first a jobs crisis. It's not really, um, uh, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a resource crisis, it's a jobs crisis. If we knew what to do with 600 million people, we would find more efficient ways um, to manage our water. We could have three big, you know, 25, 30 big companies manage plans, do it very efficiently. You know, leave, you, we could figure all of that out. 
So if the problem, the reason we have a crisis, it's a job, it's a jobs crisis, which is why thinking in this broader SDG framework, trying to look at trade trade offs, that ends up being really important. Thank you. Okay, I'll bounce back up to Anna. So um, this question is from Katie Stamler. Um, are you able to incorporate existing LID, so low impact development features to determine how effective current solutions are? And is this model available? Yeah, yeah it is actually pretty simple to um, put in um, maps of existing busuit, so that, that's done. And then there is actually another part of the model, which is dynamics, that it, it, it can um, map, uh, develop <laughs> cities over time and then incorporate WUSUD or LID over, LID over time. Uh, uh, model is open source. Yes, if you just do search urban beats, um, uh, uh, the model, the, the main, um, how can I say, the lead developer is my ex-PhD student, uh, and then he was my postdoc, and now he's in Zurich at, at ETH Zurich in EVAC, Peter Bach. So he manages this website very well. Uh, so if you go to his website, it, you, you can download a version of the model, and of course, write to him. So he's very good at this stuff. Thank you, Anna. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to ask another question to Vina, one of the audience questions, uh, Vicky Van Pop from University of Waterloo. Given the massive migration back to rural communities from COVID-19, what do you expect will be the biggest or most unique challenges faced by these communities? Yeah, well, I think that and this is all speculation, right? Um, I don't know what people are going to uh, are going to do when they get back to villages. But one thing, if they decide to stay back in the village, one thing that you see is they tend to invest back in the village, um, and they tend to uh, often the way to invest is drill deep more wells and try to get more water. That's kind of the first investment that you see happening from urban remittances. Um, so I think that if that is kind of the first wave of what people do, saying, I've got, a, I've got my urban bank account, I'm never going to go back, I'm going to take that money and see if I can make a business out of my little piece of land in the village, you're probably going to see an increase in groundwater abstraction, which, um, which given uh, that we don't have a way of managing groundwater as a commons, is going to be not good. The only hope is that if some of that reverse migration also results in better leadership and therefore a better openness towards managing water with the com as a commons, towards organizing community, educating people on, and then maybe you might, there's an opportunity that you would actually uh, leapfrog and actually then start seeing very different local participatory governance systems. So that's a hope. So I, I don't know which way it's going to go, but I can, you have to be hopeful. So. Thanks so much, Veena. Okay, and I think um, we'll also sneak in another question for Professor Ng. Um, so how good is the quality of biochar and bioactives produced as part of waste management? Uh, and then there's a second part. How good are biochar and bioactives for yield enhancement of any crop? And also would it improve the quality of the soil in the long run as well? Right, thanks, uh, Nancy. Uh, before, if I may, before, before I respond to that question, I would just like to uh, add on a little bit to what Weena said a little bit earlier about this business of uh, translation. Uh, she may be somewhat comforted to know that the issue of translation is not unique to India. Uh, we, we, <laughs> we, we also have this issue of translation even in Singapore. Um, I think the problem is translators, at least in my mind, are bilingual. Scientists are monolingual. And the guys at the other end, the engineers and the applicators and the consumers, they are also monolingual. So it's very difficult to get the scientists to explain something that is understandable 
on the part of the folks at the other end. But yet we don't have enough of these in the middle people, the translators. So I, I think going forward, perhaps one of the requirements for uh, institutes of higher learning is to decide or to, 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 to work out a program to train translators. And these are the connectors that will bring the research out into the field. Now, the other, uh, the other issue that Vina brought up, again, if it, you know, I think it may give her some comfort, the issue of scientists working in silos, again, not unique to India, all right? So, so we also have this problem here. Uh, scientists are quite notorious for working in silos because I think in defense of myself as well, because I'm also a scientist, uh, because we are trained this way. We are trained to look at things with as much depth as possible. So we are not typically trained to look horizontally. We are trained to look vertically deep down. And as we go deeper and deeper, I guess one of the uh, downsides is we become more and more silophyte. So that aside, now I come to the biochar issue. Now the quality of the biochar is very dependent on the start material. So, you know, uh, we can't tell you until we know what is your start material. If the start material is a very well-defined material, let's say uh, waste timber uh, that has not been treated in any way, but just waste timber, then you're going to get very good biochar. If it is some, uh, you know, like municipal waste, uh, solid waste, then uh, the quality can vary tremendously. So uh, I cannot give you a definitive answer to that. Bioactives is different. Bioactives, we can define the quality very, very tightly, depending on what we are trying to achieve. So in the bioactive categories, uh, there would be the enzymes, there will be the hormones, there will be the antibiotics, and there are also the live organisms themselves. And we are able to define each one of these and mix them up in various combinations, depending on the application that is required. Now, the following question is, how good are these for crop yield? Now, I can tell you that if you're only applying biochar, uh, it will not enhance your crop yield by much. Because don't forget, when you do agriculture, you're growing something to harvest. And whenever you harvest, you are taking things away from the soil. So you're taking N, you're taking P, you're taking K, and you're taking C from the soil. And these materials will have to be put back into the soil to, uh, to maintain the soil quality. So if the biochar is not complete in these kind of materials, then the crop yields will decline. Now, bioactives are not fertilizers. So I must, I must emphasize this. So you must not think of bioactives as fertilizers. Even if you apply bioactives, you still need to put the NPK and the C back into the soil. What bioactives do is they manipulate the behavior of the plants. So, so the plants become more uh, receptive to fertilizers, for example. They become more resistant to uh, fungus, for example. They may become more resistant to nematodes, for example. So there are different functions and uh, we really need to uh, look at each application and then make the decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ng. And thank you again, all panelists. This was a really engaging discussion. I liked, I liked the interaction between the panelists and with the audience. Uh, thank you all. Um, I would like to end the panel today by again thanking all three panelists, uh, Professor Anna Dalitich, Professor Wunjun Neng, and uh, Dr. Veena Srinivasan. I would also like to uh, thank you all who have uh, come online, uh, given us your uh, brilliant questions and participated in the conference. I would like to also welcome you for Water Institute Research Conference Day 2, which will be tomorrow, same time, uh, different groups of panelists. And you would have to register for this separately. If you look in your chat, there is the link for the day two of the conference. Uh, 
please do uh, log in and register. We look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning, bright and early with your coffees. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.